So Karis Price from Wall Center in today's Bodog poll question, does Archer Siloff's play at the World Championships cement him as the Canucks' primary backup this season? Yes or no, you can vote at Sick Harrison Price on Twitter. Bodog, your source, free casino games, poker strategy, and sports odds. Bodog, line of the day, French Open Tuesday, Canas Bianca Andrescu is a slight underdog to Vika Azarenka, former Grand Slam winner. You can root for BB. And if you bet her to win, she pays one sixty-five on a hundred dollar bet on your Bodog line of the day. Here he is, one half of the rink wide duo with Andrew Wad, and they're busy and at it each and every day, as well as our Vancouver Canucks reporter and uh, World Championships observer, the one and only Mr. Jeff Patterson. How we doing, Jeff? I'm good. I'm a little lost though. I don't have any World Hockey Championship to watch today, and I will I know. admit. If you had told me two weeks ago that I was going to consume as much of that tournament as I ended up doing, uh, I would have said, liar, flat out liar, no way, sun is shining here, a hockey season sort of feels like an afterthought, but like so many, I got totally invested in the Archer Silov story, and then how can you not root for Latvia? So there were a lot of really good news stories coming out of that tournament, and obviously anytime Canada strikes gold, that's good news too, uh, but yeah, I... Uh, I was up in Adam most mornings, uh, loved the early starts with the time change, and so I did end up watching an awful lot of this year's Worlds. I could tell by the number of tweets I saw from him. I'm like, ooh, I think Jeff is invested uh, into this tournament. And it was like the Land of Misfit Toys edition of this tournament, right? We were just discussing the, the superstars, not only for Canada, but for everybody, couldn't or wouldn't show up for this year. Yeah, that's a little bit different. Usually there is a little bit of star power, certainly the European teams, and we know Elias Pettersson wanted to go. The insurance issues there. William Nylander wanted to join after the Leafs were eliminated and then uh, didn't want to take somebody's spot late in the tournament, so that didn't happen. But I suppose uh, that levels the playing field to some degree. And I think from a 30,000-foot view, again, Canada winning is always a good thing, but Germany finishing runner-up, as they did at the 2018 Olympics that nobody really paid great attention to. I mean, that's two second-place finishes at big international competitions. I, like, I think this is great for the hockey world, and, and Latvia too. But think about Germany, a country of 85 million people. Hockey's never going to be number one. We know that. But when you look at Leon Dreisaitl and Tim Stutzla, Moritz Seider, who did play in this tournament... You've got 32 NHL teams. You've got all the American Hockey League affiliates. Like, they need to fill out their rosters with good hockey players. And if Germany can become anything close to, I'm not going to say a hockey power, but just a, a regular contributor, if more kids gravitate, if Germany can sort of become to hockey what Canada has been to basketball here of late and before that baseball and golf and tennis, I mean, you're going to get elite-level athletes that, you know, you watch these tournaments and maybe they get hooked on the sport of hockey. So I think it's great for the game. And then Latvia, obviously. I just, I mean, every win, every celebration, this year of all years to do it as one of the co-hosts of the tournament. And I, I, one of my favorite moments of the whole run was the final game of the preliminary round where they needed to get to overtime at the very least. They needed to secure a single point to ensure that they were going to play on. And they were playing Switzerland, who was unbeaten at that point. The Swiss scored late. Latvia tied it. The place is just going nuts in Riga. And when regulation time ended, they had secured their spot in the quarterfinals, but they had a game still to play. Like, but some of the players wanted to celebrate. You could see at the final buzzer, at least the 60-minute buzzer, guys wanted to celebrate their accomplishment, but there was still hockey to be played. And then they ended up winning that game, and there was just no quit. I mean, they were down a few times and kept on pushing, and obviously Arthur Silovs was uh, the backbone and turns out to be the tournament MVP. So just story upon story for Latvia. Uh you know, finding its way to the podium for the first time ever. We, we had hoped that five uh, Latvians, eight Germans in the National Hockey League. But mm -hmm. as Jeff notes, the German players, I mean, with the uh, dry salts established, Stutzla, Sider, Paterka, Reichel, you've got some real up-and-comers there, and two goalies. We had hoped that uh, the Abbey Canucks would go on a run to give Silov some big game opportunities uh, in the uh, Calder Cup, uh, you know, chase. But th this this served to be that as well, didn't it? I mean, it, it, say what you want about the level of competition. We would have said that about a Calder Cup run as well. It's not the NHL, but it's a uh, it's a test. He did face NHL shooters throughout the, uh, the the tournament. Well, yes, that. But also, as one of the host teams, like, Latvia opened this tournament at home on a Friday night, the feature game against Canada, and that country came to a standstill. 
Unfortunately, so did their players. They were down 2 nothing five minutes in, and that's when the hook came out, the starter was gone, and the Arthur Silov story began at that moment. Now, a, a little side story to all of that is, think about that. Like, I would assume that the Latvian coach started what he felt was the best goaltender he had at his uh, disposal against Canada in the tournament opener on home ice in Riga. The guy lasts five minutes. He gives up two. The second one was bad, right through the wickets. Uh, that guy never saw the ice again to the point that he didn't even dress for any of the elimination round games. So the tournament starter, I, I, I can't recall on that sort of stage where a guy has gone from number one to yesterday's news as quickly as this guy did, but it opened the door for Arthur Silovs. And, and when Silovs left Abbotsford, I have to imagine, he was a little disappointed. He only got one of the four games against the Calgary Wranglers, and that was partly because Spencer Martin had proven himself, and Jeremy Colleton had two choices, and he opted to go with Spencer Martin in three of the four games. But you're a competitor. You're Arthur Silovs. You want the net. And so I would think that not only because Abbotsford's season was over, but also the fact that he didn't play much in that series against the Wranglers, probably feeling a little down about himself. My guess is he didn't really know where he sat on the pecking order on Team Latvia, but he was going home to represent his country, a great opportunity just to be involved, and then to have this storybook play out the way it did. But it's a really good thing that he was the backup in that opener, because they carry three goalies. If the other, you know, if the third guy had been the backup, Maybe he writes this story and Arthur Silovs doesn't ever see any game action. So it's always a numbers game when you're a goaltender. There's only the one net and Arthur Silovs got it and he didn't give it up. And I heard Gordon Miller say late in the Latvian, uh, the, as that game went to overtime against the U.S., the bronze medal game, if that game had gone the distance, if it had gone to a shootout and overtime, it was 10 minutes of OT, Arthur Silovs would have passed Sean Burke for the all-time record for minutes played by a goaltender in one world championship. So this guy was busy. Uh, he was really good, and the proof's in the pudding. He's got the uh, bronze medal to show for it, the MVP, and apparently a national holiday. Uh, <laughs> pretty good run uh, for, for Silovs and those Latvians. When you can provide a stat day for your country men and women, that is achievement. And and the Canucks can't uh, be upset with the fact that you know he wears Canuck gear. That the Johnny Canuck logo was there to be <laughs> yeah, seen absolutely. throughout the whole tournament. I mean, it looks good for them. Now, a couple of bits of context: bigger tournament right now, so more minutes played. I think that factored in Fair a enough. little bit. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, um, I don't want to have to go through the annals of Russian coaches and their goaltending decisions over the years because yeah. there've been some very odd ones in international tournament from Russian benches. Answer me the Bodog poll. Do you think this cements him as the Canucks backup? I'll get to that in a sec. I just want to pick up one. Blake asked me a little bit about, you know, what does this do for, for Silovs? I think the other thing to keep in mind here, guys, is, you know, if this is any other year where this tournament is played in Sweden, if it's played in one of those off years where it's in France or Denmark or whatever, there's still pressure because the Latvians dropped their first two games and then basically had to run the table. But you think about doing it in front of that home fan base where they were, you know, Group B in, in Riga, every night was a home game where the fate of the country was on your shoulders. And so you talk about big game experience, and then that final game against Switzerland where they had to get a single point, like there was just no margin of error or for error. And so that was just sort of added context to all that Arthur Silovs did. Now, I'm going to vote no to the poll question simply because I, I think what this does is it really opens the door for the Vancouver Canucks to explore their options, to be creative here. They've got a guy that just came off this incredible run at the World Hockey Championship, but he's played all the five games in the National Hockey League. This market was going goo-goo for Spencer Martin, who had played six games for the Vancouver Canucks and earned that two-year contract not that long ago, uh, just after Bruce Boudreau took over. So, again, small sample size. Now Silovs is younger. Uh, he certainly projects to be a National Hockey Leaguer on a full-time basis and all those types of things, but... I think with the farm team based in Abbotsford now, there are a couple of options. Maybe he comes to camp and just blows the doors off and picks up where he left off the Worlds, and he plays his way into that backup role. And if that happens, that happens. And then the Canucks are going to be set between the pipes. I still think at this stage of his career, he's 22. He just turned 22. During COVID, he didn't play much. So this past season was really, you know, his first full year of game action in a couple of seasons at such a, a critical time. Uh, for player development, particularly goaltenders. So I think there's a couple of ways they could run it. They, I think you could look at Spencer Martin, give him another opportunity to be the backup to start. Silov starts in Abbotsford, is the guy almost every night out, plays and plays a lot. And when you get to Christmas, maybe you reevaluate. Where are 
Where's the big league team? We know the importance of a fast start for the Vancouver Canucks at the NHL level. Thatcher Demko is going to play and play a lot. Like, this team cannot afford to fall behind the eight ball the way it has the last couple of seasons. So uh, I think on paper right now, and we haven't seen the schedule yet, but Thatcher Demko is going to be slated to play an awful lot. And I think he has to, and he's got to be good. So real realistically, how many opportunities will there be for the backup between the start of the season and Christmas? Probably not that many. And there would only be a handful of back-to-backs in there. So I think you could look at it a couple of ways. You could go with Spencer Martin as the de facto backup to start. He travels you know, spot duty for for Demko. Maybe there's a couple of additional starts in there when the schedule gets thick. But the other one, I guess, is, you know, use the fact that Abbotsford is just down the highway. When the Canucks are at home, you know, bring Silovs up. He's waiver exempt. Like, this team now has some flexibility with its farm team just down the highway. Uh, and the waiver rules, like, use those to your advantage. And so make sure he got his five games last year. I do think it's important that you know, he doesn't take a step back. So I would look to get Arthur Silov's, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 NHL games this year. And Spencer Martin's got to understand that this is all part of the plan that Silov's, whether he likes it or not, Silov's is more important to the organization than Spencer Martin is. I think the Canucks have to be clear. They've got to articulate this plan to the goaltender so they all know where they stand. And then, of course, injury can throw that plan right out the window. But uh, you don't bank on injuries. You're hoping that Thatcher Demko has a great offseason here to train and prepare and hits the ground running the way that he did to close out this past season. But I do think uh, Silov's performance and just the fact that they've got Spencer Martin under contract for one more year, uh, you know, it, it provides some options and some opportunities for this organization to get creative in the way that it uses its goaltending. Ethan Bear got hurt, and you never want to see a player get hurt at the Worlds, and he got hurt while out of contract too, Jeff, and really not having a deal is something that has prevented players from going to the Worlds in the past, even if it is restricted free agency as opposed to unrestricted free agency. I just want your thoughts on that, but also, as I mentioned in the welcome mat, perhaps there's a silver lining here that Ethan Bear goes, wow. I went to the Worlds without a contract, got hurt, kind of risky. Maybe I'd just settle for what the Vancouver Canucks want to pay me and be happy to take my you know, NHL contract and the bank money right here and right now when he's perhaps feeling a little vulnerable. Yeah, I tried to watch the gold medal celebration with my sort of sleuth cap and a magnifying glass to see if I could see anything. I was just I was delighted to see Ethan Bear out there in full uniform as the suspended Joe Valeno was as well. And so they didn't send him home. Uh, he was able to be on the ice and be a part of it and feel like he was a part of it. So I think that tells you that this isn't a catastrophic injury. Uh, but beyond that, we don't know. I know Rick Dollywell reported he would be seen by Canuck doctors when he got back to town here. It's unfortunate uh, he got hurt late, I think, at the final buzzer of the quarterfinal game against Finland. There was a suggestion that maybe it was a slash that took him out of uh, action. Whatever the case, he didn't play the semifinal and certainly didn't suit up in the gold medal game. Uh, as for what this means for his contract, again, I, I don't know that this injury... Until we find out a little bit more, I'm not sure that I can connect dots here between the injury and what it's going to mean for his contract. I still wonder, can the Vancouver Canucks afford Ethan Bear? Because we already know they're overcommitted as far as the cap is concerned, which is fine here in the offseason, but it doesn't include contracts for a guy like Ethan Bear. Uh, Akito Rossi needs a new deal as well. Uh, And and I I don't know. I mean, I I have sleepless nights sometimes here thinking about the right side of the Canuck defense and and what does it look like (laughs) and where does uh, Ethan Bear ultimately slot in? Because there's always this talk, too, about Luke Shen and should they be hot and heavy on Luke Shen again? Well, I kind of need to know, and I hope they know, what the right side of their defense looks like. Philip Ronick obviously, is going to be the lead dog. Uh, I think Tyler Myers, with his contractual situation, is going to start the season here. So uh, I'm slotting him in. That's gold medal champion Tyler Myers, uh, of course. Mm -hmm. And... uh, and then, you know, is Ethan Bear in their plans? Do they want to try to go younger? We've talked about, you know, a guy like Noah Juleson. Did Noah Juleson give you anywhere close to what Ethan Bear gave you, but at a fraction of the cost? And so I do think, and then, you know, that doesn't even take into account Luke Chen and where he would fall in their plan. So, uh, again, I think there's a lot of moving parts here. But I just wonder with Ethan Bear, like he's got arbitration rights. He's going to cost them something that starts with a two at the very least. 
And this is a team where every dollar matters to the Vancouver Canucks. So I think they want to get Ethan Bear under contract, but I'm not sure that it's going to be as simple as I agree. just coming to terms and signing well, off on a new contract. I think it yeah, starts with a three, to be honest. That, that's uh, that's why I wonder whether, you know, strength while the iron's hot here, maybe he feels a little bit vulnerable uh, af- after that injury. Um, you mentioned gold medal champion Tyler Myers. You saw the Instagram post, I'm sure, as well. Hey, you know, he's puffing his chest out a little bit and taking shots at critics, and, and rightfully so, because there was a lot of people who looked at this Canadian team and said, really, that's a Canada team at the World Championships? Well, yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, a little surprised to see Tyler Myers in the aftermath of a gold medal celebration poking the bear, but hey, people have been poking Tyler Myers for a while in this market, and it wasn't, I don't think, personal about him and his performance. It was more about the team. Uh, maybe he saw some things that I didn't, and that's fine, uh, we touched on it off the top. This was not a star-laden World Hockey Championship, so anything that was said about Canada, I think, could be applied. In fact, I know on Rinkwide, we talked about the American roster and the fact that it really lacked in in star power. So, uh, you know, Canada, yeah, it didn't have uh, some of the players that it could have, obviously, but uh, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't see the detractors that he referenced, whatever the case. Uh, he got his shot in, uh, but he won his gold medal, and good on him. Uh, there were some moments of sort of the things that we're used to seeing from Tyler Myers, uh, some of the defensive decisions and reads, and he does love to sprawl and use the all seven feet of his body to try to play defense on the ice uh, a little more often than coaches would probably like, but uh, I doubt at this stage of his career that uh, much is going to change in that regard. So, uh, I, you know, I, I salute all the guys that uh, made the commitment. It is a beast of a tournament in terms of length, and you mentioned that, that more games now, Matt. Like, it's unbelievable that it started two weeks and two days earlier on the Friday, and that preliminary round feels like it takes forever. They've played three or four games, and they look, and they're only halfway through that, and, and yeah. then the medal round as well. And, you know, interesting, too, with the back-to-backs to the way that it finishes up, the Saturday and Sunday, the semis, and right into the, the gold medal game. And so it's a lot of hockey in a relatively short period of time. And so any guy that makes the commitment to his country and to his family to go over there, uh, I certainly salute them. Um, and look, Tyler Myers isn't going to be everybody's favorite player. We, we recognize that he's got his flaws. Um, but, uh, again, like I, I feel good for him for winning a gold medal. I played 24 minutes and 44 seconds of the gold medal game. Only Mackenzie Weaker played more for Canada. So, uh, you know, that was a game that, uh, was finished in regulation time. And Tyler Myers logs almost 25 minutes of ice time. The other guy quickly is Milan Lucic. And I just think, you know, when you think of, the way that he plays, the age, the stage of his career out of contract as well, and for him to get the opportunity and take it and, you know, a guy who's made a living just crunching other players and and in international competition, you know that just heavy body contact quite often results in penalties, and so you kind of wondered about mindset, but he didn't look out of place and, you know, had a nice pass to Adam Fantilli on the uh, goal that uh, uh, in the semifinal game, so he was uh, able to contribute in that regard, but I just thought, you know, what a cool experience for Milan Lucic, a guy that normally wouldn't get an opportunity, and he knows the clock's ticking on his professional hockey career, so I'm sure he jumped at it and uh, made the most. And so when I look at, you know, Myers and Bear that play for the Canucks, to Foley and Brad Hunt, former Canucks, and then you got the Vancouverite in Milan Lucic as well, pretty uh, strong connection here to the West Coast on that gold medal winning team. You missed, uh, what's his name, Carconi? Yeah, Michael Carconi, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, lastly, Jeff... And once upon a time, your better half uh, gave us the skinny on all of this. You might remember the uh, pandemic hits with Shannon Patterson of yes. CTV. Yeah. And happy anniversary to the Pattersons. They uh, celebrated their anniversary this weekend. But Jeff and Shannon met in Kamloops when you were the voice of the Blazer. She was a Cub reporter. Jeff, how much are the Pattersons keeping an eye on the Kamloops Memorial Cup that's ongoing? Uh, I'm keeping pretty close tabs. Shannon, not at all. Then, <laughs> um, in fact, I tried to pass along the score last night that they got double digits. She didn't care in the uh, least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they didn't look good in the opener. They'd been off for a while and they are there as the host team. But uh, this is not just your normal host team. I mean, this is a, a really good hockey club. But when you get to the Memorial Cup, obviously, we're dealing with three league champions and then the host team. Some years, the host team isn't up to this caliber. You know, I think they had to work a little rust off. Maybe they were surprised by the speed of the Quebec team in the opener, uh, but they got back to playing their way yesterday and got out to a good start. 
uh, steel guys, their best players showed up and didn't expect 10, which I see is a uh, blazer uh, franchise record in the Memorial Cup by cold games. They won, they scored eight in the championship game back in 1995, but uh, getting the double digits in the Memorial Cup and close to 50 shots last night. There was a scary moment when Kyle Masters, the defenseman, went into the boards awkwardly. They had to bring the stretcher out. You hate to see that at any point in sport. So uh, hoping that he's okay because uh, they can certainly use him as this tournament unfolds. I still think the Seattle Thunderbirds are the team to beat, but I have said this before that you know, Kamloops got knocked out of the Western playoff, Western League playoffs by the stacked Seattle team that went on to beat Winnipeg to punch its ticket to the tournament. Kamloops beat Seattle twice in that series, so Seattle prevailed in six games. You get to a short-form tournament like this, Kamloops the home team, home ice, the fans, and everything else, they may only need to beat Seattle once at the very end in the championship game if the cards fall their way. So two games in, they still have to play Seattle in the preliminary round. Uh, we'll see Seattle and Quebec who comes out of that game 2-0. and But uh, yeah, tournament's off and running, and certainly memories come flooding back. The tournament, uh, the, the rink looks great. Uh, by all accounts, the city has been a spectacular host as it was back in 1995. So uh, I will be, now, now that the worlds are over, uh, yeah, nice. I'll very much focus my attention on right. what's left of the Memorial Cup. And uh, what a week for Tom Gillardi uh, with both of the Scam Loops <laughs> Blazers, as we mentioned, and the Dallas Stars here. Yeah, not bad Still for Shane, Shane Doan either, who, uh, of course, yeah. is part owner, but uh, part of the gold medal contingent. Apparently, he's flying from uh, Finland straight to Kamloops to take part uh, in the remainder of the Memorial Cup. Marvelous stuff, Jeff. We'll be listening to Rinkwide this week. Thanks for this. And uh, you're sitting in for Blake later in the week, so we'll see you then. Sounds good.